I'm now pleased to introduce two research professionals who are connected in different ways to the Center for Open Science and our Open Science Framework, or OSF. Felipe Villanova is a PhD candidate at Pontifical Catholic University of Rio Grande do Sul and a faculty member at La Sala University in Brazil. Felipe is an advocate for open research practices, particularly in South America. He is a COS ambassador and has worked with us to improve OSF resources, including translating OSF documentation. Clark Iacovacus is a scholarly services librarian and associate professor at Oklahoma State University in Stillwater, Oklahoma in the United States. Clark's interests include scholarly publishing, open access, copyright, programming pedagogy, and bibliometric analysis. As part of his role as scholarly services librarian, Clark provides workshops on a number of research technology research technology tools, including the Open Science Framework. Welcome to you both. Thanks, great to be here. Thanks, um, Terry. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great to see you both again. Uh, Felipe, I thought maybe uh, we could start out our conversation uh, maybe with a question to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, you've partnered with COS and OSF in a few different ways. And so I'm curious to know, you know, a little bit more about how you got connected with, connected with us in the first place. And, you know, maybe what you found especially exciting or unique uh, about OSF, considering there are a lot of open research tools with a lot of functionality out there. Yeah, well, it's a very interesting story because uh, I got connected to open science overall and OSF in particular because my former co-advisors in my master's studies, um, I was asking a data set to him and he said, well, I will share the data set with you as long as you pre-register um, your hypothesis. And I was like, what the hell is like pre-registration? So I started looking at it and I got involved with the open science overall. And that's how I got to open science and the COS and the OSF at first place. So this was how I, was, how I got there. But uh, what kept me there, I think it's mainly like two things that got me really involved with open science. First of all, I think it's like, um, in particular, the OSF structure is really good because we can put everything that we use in research there. So we can put the data set, we can put the syntax, and we can put the materials there. So I think it's great because um, Normally, when we have umbrella projects, we have a lot of data sets, a lot of different versions of the data sets. So when we publish um, a paper, so sometimes it's hard to find like the version of the data set that you actually use. So when you upload it on the OS app, it's much easier to know like what, you know, the data set, the syntax that you use. So I think it's great. Uh, yeah. The platform helps you a lot in the research um, enterprise. So I think this is like, Practically, this is great, something great. But there is also another thing which really got me interested um, in the COS, the OSF as well, which is like the COS team. I think that the, like you do a great job and there are a lot of passionate people there. They are really passionate about um, open science. And I, I would like to stress like the name of uh, Daniel, Daniel Stegger. He like, he was, he's really passionate about open science and we conducted a lot of different projects together. And they were really successful in, for example, you mentioned the translation of the OSF help guides. Um, it was like something that we started and this is an initiative that nowadays is like much bigger than we first thought it could be. So I, and I also had contact with other people like Erin and you, Terry as well. So I think that the realizing how committed people in the COS are to open science, I think it's great because, you know, we we can't do anything alone. So the cooperation with these people and people who are actually working exclusively on it and focusing on different, um, you know, advocacy projects for open science, I think it's great. So I would highlight these both things here that like really got me committed to open science. And this is why I, I'm here in the end of the day things, you know? So yeah, that's yeah. it. Thanks so much for that. Uh, but maybe before I go to Clark, I wonder if you could give a little bit more detail just in terms when you refer to o uh, OSF documentation, the help guides, what type of information is uh, inside of those? And, you know, we know at COS that a lot of researchers come to OSF seeking a technology solution, but they have very different levels of 
um, technical expertise, but also they might not even know what they're looking for in the first place. So how does how does a help guide help them from your perspective? Yeah, this is really important because the thing is that like always when I talked about open science here in Brazil, uh, I talked about it and people um, thought it was like a great, amazing, a great initiative, etc. But they didn't know how to use the, the COS and there was a major barrier, which was the language barrier. And I, I realized that this was not something unique to Brazil because I went to Colombia, I went to Peru, and they all had like the same problem, which was like, okay, I can speak English that fluently or I can understand that without a, a Google translator. So it's really... Um, it's really hard and we need a lot of a lot of effort to like advance the steps of pre-registration and always get back to you know Google Translator and you know you people are usually not sure whether the term that is there really matches the technical term in their language. So I think that um, overcoming this language barrier is particularly important for increasing the reach of the um, the the platform overall and pre-registration this kind of stuff because although like most people in the world don't speak english we only have access to osf and the cos in english so it, it's like a really important and a major barrier so when we have like help guides in in other languages then it's really important because you know people in africa people in south america people in brazil people in argentina people in chile people in peru people in colombia they can uh still pre-register reg regardless of their lack of you know um english knowledge or something like that so um, i would point this out as a key a key aspect you know of these help guides yeah i think that's really helpful context um to, for me to be reminded of but certainly i think for our audience to to hear as well and to understand um clark uh moving to you i uh when you and i first met uh we were speaking and i noted that your experience with technology tools like osf might be a little bit different than someone like felipe who is directly conducting the research um just in the sense that you know as a scholarly uh or as a, a, a research support professional scholarship uh, support professional um you work with a lot of scholars across many different you know fields and and backgrounds um, and and certainly methodolo methodological approaches too. So I'm wondering, um, you know, in your experience, are there certain fields or disciplines uh, where the oh, use of open research tools and methods are more established than others? And what your experience has been um, just sort of leveraging OSF or other and other, you know, in collaboration with other research tools to, you know, to address that. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Uh, so when I was thinking about answering this question, um, one of my roles at OSU is I'm the lead administrator for our research information management system. So I was, you know, maybe I can look at that and collect data on faculty publications, data sets, and so on to see if I can kind of get a perspective. And um, as I was doing that, I, there it really came about that very few individuals are inputting data about their open research practices into this system. And it made me think about the um, strategy for culture change document that um, uh, Brian Nosek wrote a few years ago, where there can be infrastructure in place, there can be, you know, a user interface, but until there are norms, incentives, and policies in place, really, it's uptake is going to be somewhat spotty. Um, so, you know, not really being able to track open data sets there, I um, looked th through, uh, I have another colleague who's doing research on using data site as a way of um, tracking open data sharing. Um, and there's a presentation of that here. And that too, it's spotty. You know, there's some data sets for there from Dryad um, and so on. And some disciplinary uh, uh, trends come about. Um, I'll get to what I found when I looked at our OSF data here in a moment, but um, the point is to say that uh, it can be a, re a real challenge to systematically collect that information. Definitely when it comes to OSF, we see psychology uh, really coming to the forefront in terms of adoption and usage of OSF, and I'll, I'll give some examples in a moment. Um, and But this is really relevant in light of the Nelson memo from the OSTP, where institutions are really potentially going to be on the hook for um, ensuring that PIs are compliant with these terms. So I think that those norms, if they start to change, may um, 
will see tools like OSF be adopted more and more, not only to allow for PIs to report that kind of information to institutions, but for institutions to be able to, um, to track that. Uh, and there's a number of initiatives underway to institute um, um, persistent identifier infrastructure from NISO, for example, and um, I'll put some links in the chat for that. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so I do see trends, but it's it's data that is really difficult to get at. You, just as a follow-up question to that, do you sense uh, any discrepancy or, or distinction between institution type too. So OSU, I think is an R1 university. Um, you know, I don't know if you have an experience with other types of institutions, but uh, my understanding is that that can influence to whether, you know, it could be one variable in uh, open research adoption as well. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And um, I thought it was interesting that Dr. Duck Duckworth used the phrase, um, it's going from nice to have to need to have. And I would point in that respect to two uh, recent articles by Christine Borgman looking at data sharing. Um, and the first one is on the notion of why it takes a village to manage and share data. And I think that those institutions that have both the administrative kind of leadership and resources and infrastructure for creating data management training um, and uh, support services across many different offices are going to be you know much in a much greater position than institutions that may not either have that kind of priority um, or the the resources and infrastructure to um, to support that which is another reason why OSF is valuable um, because that infrastructure doesn't require you know, specific dedication of institutional resources. Yeah, that's good to know. And, and this would probably be a good uh, point for me to mention that uh, although OSF is uh, open and free for any researcher to use, uh, we do have a, a institutional membership uh, model around OSF where um, institutions of all types, um, you know, have different tier structures of, uh, of membership. So uh, for those in the audience who uh, might want to learn more about that, we'll have more information forthcoming. Yeah, um, and we were really excited, sorry, just to, to join no, no, sure. OSF uh, institutions in 2019. Um, and that was something that we prioritized as a unit and um, our dean has supported um, and always enjoyed the excellent support of OSF. And we've been giving workshops on OSF for several years now. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more a little bit later about where we see that coming out. Sure. Administrator support is always a uh, crucial <laughs> in many in many respects. Um, Felipe, I wanted to turn back to you and ask you about, uh, you know, in our conversation uh, when we met, um, it was very obvious that you're uh, passionate about open access journals, um, specifically OA journals in the Latin American context. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind describing a little bit about what's unique about OA journals in Latin America um, and how you've been involved with them um, in your region. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that like um, directly answering your question, uh, what's so special about OA journals in Latin America? It's because we don't need to pay anything to publish there, and people don't need to pay anything to read like their articles. So um, this is something that a lot of people, like in the, most of the world, the researchers across um, almost all parts of the globe, um, really lack money. And you know, science requires money in one way or another, either to hire people to conduct interviews or you know analyze data or this kind of stuff, or to get the software or pay for the papers. So uh, in way or another, we need to we need money to conduct research, but it's good when we have the possibility to like read articles that don't have like paywalls. So um, in Latin America, we are particularly um, how could I say that we are like particularly pioneering in this aspect that most. Uh, things that are published in our journals here they're like open access but there is a problem because like 
it's not of the best interest of these big publishers, you know, that there are many free articles that are like free of charges in this diamond um, model, which like people don't need to pay to to publish and people don't need to pay to read the papers because like it, it makes a bit hard. Like where does the money come from? This is the thing. When we have uh, journals like this, we need like a federal government agency support, financial support to like pay people to work in these journals. And this is like, this is not for profit, you know, a for profit activities such as running like most journals that we have international journals. So it's a big challenge because in one way, like it's a lot of work and people don't want to do this like for free. Nobody wants to work like for free, you know, without getting any recompensation for that. So this is one aspect. And there is another aspect, which is like these big publishers don't want this, that these journals exist. They, they, they prefer to, you know, charge authors with these APCs. And there is one important thing to say, like these APCs, they are not feasible like if we compare like how much an, a median apc i had this data but i don't have this like on top of my head but if we compare like the minimum wage in brazil with like the median uh, apc in most international journals in psychology which is my area one cannot pay that so it, it's an absurd because like we have a lot of people dying here from starvation because they don't have money to eat and these journals are like you know oh you have to pay i don't know two thousand dollars to publish like What's the point of it? You know, we don't have two thousand dollars always to to pay for a publication. And this is really important because once we put like barriers into knowledge transmission, the thing is that uh we are not we are somewhat making it more difficult for science to advance. And I think that is really important when we talk about open science that like these barriers we're trying ultimately to eliminate these barriers and make that like knowledge is free, you know, and available for everyone. So it's really hard. So if the, in the U.S. or in Western Europe, it's hard to get funding to publish in these journals. Imagine in poor countries such as Brazil, or which is not like the most po the poorest country in the world, but like our resources are really, really re limited. So uh, imagine if it's hard there, imagine here. It's almost impossible. You have to be like in a top university to get the funding necessary to publish like in an op open access journal once in three years or something like that. So it's really hard, you know, it's a big thing and it's, it's a big challenge as well. We have to have, like, we got to have a lot of uh, backup and a, a really good team to go against this interest because like the, the, the barriers, the financial barriers that we face beyond these other ba barriers that I already mentioned, such as, for example, the language barrier. Now there is this financial barrier, etc. It's really it's really hard. So I would say that um, a major challenge for us who are working with open science is like how to eliminate these, these financial barriers, because people like in, in most countries of the world don't have the money to pay uh, the, these article processing charges. And they also don't have money to pay like for the subscription of these top journals. So ultimately, people are not really... Uh, getting sense of the state of the art of the literature on the topic that they are studying if they are in a university or in a country which doesn't have uh, enough resources. So it's a really practical barrier that we have to address here. At COS, we work collaboratively with a lot of other open science reformers, of course, but also with scholarly publishers. And, you know, I'm part of conversations or I hear of conversations that we have that are on very... Um, I don't know, theoretical or conceptual levels, but I think sometimes it's easy to forget what kind of real world impact those policies, things like APCs have on individual researchers. And certainly, you know, we we forget sometimes, I for, certainly forget sometimes about the cultural differences, you know, depending on the cultural context. So that's helpful to hear, Felipe. Um, I wonder if uh, now might be a good time to turn to our Q&A. There's a question in here from Laura. Laura asks, uh, can't AI really help with fleshing out the documentation, but also uh, couldn't AI help facilitate other aspects of open science processes too? So I wonder maybe the first part of that question, um, Felipe, in your work uh, with um, developing you know, documentation for OSF, have you employed AI at all? And what did that look like? No, we didn't use AI because like at the time that we first started, like ChatGPT wasn't disseminated as it is today. So uh, it wasn't really a good option. And in Google Translator, there is like a, a limit of uh, how many words you can put there. So yeah, although we sometimes use this, like using AI was not a uh, feasible option at the moment. And well, I think that definitely it could help, but still like when we consider a language like uh, Brazilian Portuguese, it's kind of tricky to do this because like, um, 
at first time, like when you're asking ChatGPT to translate it to Portuguese, usually it translates to like Portuguese of Portugal. So there are some important differences. And even if you say, please translate it to Brazilian Portuguese, it's still somewhat mixed. So we cannot rely like 100% in, in AI to make these translations. It obviously helps, but I would like suggest that if someone is looking right now in this moment, like in the future, I don't know how it's going to be. But right now I would recommend people using Google Translator to translate something to Brazilian Portuguese instead of ChatGPT because you know th there are these tricky expressions which it still mixes like Portuguese in Portugal with Brazilian Portuguese so it, it's kind of hard you know if if I could add something um that that uh that second article that I just linked from Christine Borgman addresses the and this kind of ties into what Brian was talking about with trustworthiness which is that making the entire research process trustworthy. Uh, you know, with AI, we, we have a sort of diminished ability to trust digital content in general. Um, the algorithms are opaque, the training models are opaque. Um, the research community is al <clears throat> already demanding more transparency of the evidence of claims and the provenance of assertions and so on. And so I think that, um, being able to make that whole process transparent is one way of kind of increasing, boosting that the trustworthiness in the face of all the uncertainty provided with a with AI. Great point. I'll mention too that um, for anyone in the audience who's interested in uh, more interested in information on the uh, sort of the the interface or the connection between um, AI and open science. I've included in some of the follow-up materials I've put together uh, some information on a couple of meta science projects that COS is conducting regarding um, using AI uh, and large language models to uh, help with um, evaluating the confidence of research claims. So um, more information to come from there. Really interesting stuff. Um, turning back to my questions here, Clark, uh, one of your specializations is uh, research data curation and analysis. And so I thought I'd ask if there are any examples or anecdotes of researchers you've worked with uh, at OSU or, or elsewhere um, who have used OSF to curate their data in a novel way or have used OSF maybe in combination with another research tool to make their data accessible to other researchers. Yeah, yeah. And again, I'll put a bunch of links into the chat there. Um, one, your question earlier about differences between institutions, um, you know, that's a question about norms and resources. And um, the, as I mentioned, the psychology department here at OSU um, has really been prolific adopters of uh, OSF, not only OSF uh, projects, but also registrations and um, preprints. And um, that, that first link there is a talk to one of our psychology resource re researchers who mentioned that uh, she first started using OSF as a way for, to help her be a better mentor to students, to, for them to be able to be transparent in their processes and so that she could uh, provide troubleshooting support um, and see a reproducible workflow. But um, she's gone on to uh, adopt registrations for what she calls risky uh, research, where they're less confident and they'll obtain statistically significant results, but the research is still important to run uh, to combat, you know, publication bias. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very short talk, but it's uh, kind of worth looking into. And then there's a few other examples there. Some of these are pretty unique um, where the, the there's pre-registration, there's pre-print. Um, the second one in the list there, I think, or no, might be the the last one so they ran a um they ran an oh i or i didn't put it at all here here it is sorry so they did an analysis they made the preprint available uh and then during that analysis they found that uh, that they needed to rerun one of the experiments and so they refined the materials from the experiment and they pre-registered that one so again kind of showing that these tools allow one to be transparent and kind of build off of different research projects, uh, as well as, of course, enhancing collaboration. Um, 
So yeah, there, those are just a handful. There's also one example there of a professor who wrote an open educational resource, a textbook, where they archive that on OSF. So I think we see a lot of different use cases. That's great. I appreciate you providing these examples and I uh, will make sure that we grab, uh, or actually you can, if you wouldn't mind sending me uh, a list of these uh, resources afterwards, we can make them available somehow to our audience. Sure thing. Um, in the couple of moments we have left uh, for both of you, I suppose I wanted to ask you, um, you know, I, I went to graduate school, I wrote a master's thesis, and that was uh, experience enough for me. It was frustrating at times and certainly, uh, you know, exhausting in a lot of ways. I couldn't imagine being a full-time researcher myself, um, but I wonder, you know, for, for both of you, uh, research is, is, as I mentioned, can be an exhausting and frustrating endeavor, um, you know, in, to begin with, but trying to reform it, adopting open science and encouraging others to do so. It's a lot. And so I wonder, you know, uh, briefly from both of you, if you wouldn't mind sharing just personally, what keeps you going, what keeps you inspired uh, to keep doing this? May I go first? Yeah, well, I think that um, I talked about it like at the beginning of my uh, speech here, but I think that like, um, the first, the first thing is that like I really believe in open knowledge. You know, I think it's really important because like for science to advance, we need to have open knowledge. So, um, more theoretically, or I don't know, talking about principles, I would say that this is like what keeps me there. And for practical reasons, I would say that like um, it's really important to have all stuff in one um single platform, which can can do this, which like with the resources that OSF offers. So it's it's this. But well, especially because like here I think hearing Clark talk, it's really interesting because like the scenario, the research scenario in like the US is so different from here in Brazil and Latin America overall that I think um open science and open knowledge is important like across the whole globe. But I think it's particularly important for like countries that are developing countries, because as I said, we don't have money. So we need to have access to information like in a free manner, you know, like without having to invest thousands of dollars on something because we don't have this thousands of dollars. So I think that like uh, ultimately more than a principle or, you know, a new topic view of knowledge or something like that. There is a very practical reason, which is like a, to overcome our underdeveloped situation. We need to have like, um, we need to get in touch with scientific knowledge. And if you have, we have, but here it's like a visual, a visual circle, because if we don't have money, we don't have access to knowledge. And if we don't have access to knowledge, we can't like get develop the country and have more money. And so, you know, it's like a, a loop, yeah, which we have to get out. And I think that uh, open knowledge, open science overall, it's um, a really important factor. I think that like, uh, there is no way out. I think that uh, these barriers and, and and the the wall, the paywalls, this kind of model that we have, it's going to be exterminated at some point in time. So we're like at so, somewhat in the avant-garde, so in some way. So we know. I think it won't last forever. So I, I'm sure that like we're on the right side of the story of the history, you know. So I know that like at some point in the future. People will look at, look back and say, how did people accept that? That like they had to pay to get information and get scientific knowledge. If it's something really important for humanity, how come that like it's behind this paywall? So uh, it's basically that that keeps me involved with it, you know, um, knowing that uh, the future is about open science and the barriers that we are facing now, they, they, are, they will be in this specific time point that we're living now. So, yeah. Being on the right side of history, I like that. Thanks, Felipe. Any thoughts from you, Clark? Yeah, I, yeah. I've been working in this space, open access, uh, open research for a long time now, and um, the 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 culture change has been very slow um, for a number of reasons. But it is, I do see signs that it is starting to change, um, and. Uh, Paywalls are damaging 
you know, across the board, regardless of between regions. And I've even worked for small institutions where we we're affected by that. And so, um, yeah, yeah, that I would, I would just echo the same sorts of sentiments that Felipe was, um, but there are a number of barriers, um, and, and research evaluation really being the number one where, and that's been sort of a huge lag in change with the lack of incentives and, um, um, but again, we are seeing signs of change, and I hate to do this link dump, but I, um, this is another good recent article about, and coming back to what Brian was saying about building trust, um, and that is in ways that we can um, trust metrics on open data use and reuse and re responsible interpretation of those metrics so as they don't kind of turn into another misuse or oversimplification like we've seen in a lot of bibliometrics and citation metrics. Right. And Clark, no need for apology with the links. As a scholarly services librarian, I would expect you to be at the ready with uh, resources and, and references. <laughs> That's right. I can't help myself. <laughs> well, Felipe Clark, thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciated uh, your time and I enjoyed talking with you. I know our audience uh, found value in it too. Uh, I will direct you both to um, a couple of questions in the uh, Q&A if you wouldn't mind addressing those.